You can see all right now? Fine. Everything's okay. Everything's okay. Fine. You remember, uh, you remember, uh, oh, about six, six years ago, a fellow called Milt Kamen, when we first brought him out, it was his yes. first appearance on The Tonight Show. You know he's going on to be a big star. He's going to be in a new Broadway show. He's a very inventive man, a very funny man, and a very nice man. Uh, I'd like you to meet him tonight. He has a movie review for us. M Mr. Milt Kamen. We have a new we have a co-star here tonight. Tex Very and nice. Jinx. Here we are. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, I was talking about Cochran being a bachelor. He's a bachelor, you know. Yes, I know. He never too married. Too young for me. Oh, there you are. A little too young. Yeah, well, I don't know about that. You uh, I like a little older man. You do? Yeah. Older than me? A little older than you. She had an affair with yeah. Charlie Weaver once and never got over it. <laughs> <laughs> what about this uh, bachelorhood of yours? Well, when are you going to oh, I'll, I'll, uh, take the oath? No, I'll, I'll get married one of these days. I mean, as soon as I grow up, I'm good. No, I, uh, I, wanna, I think I'm emotionally ready for marriage, Jack. I well, think I am. I think you are. I think you're overtrained. <laughs> yes, probably. <laughs> I think I, uh, <laughs> well, I, I'm emotionally ready for marriage. I don't think I'm emotionally ready for divorce. That's the thing that's disturbing me. And I feel guilty because I know somewhere I'm denying a nice lady alimony. <laughs> But well, listen, by the way, speaking about bachelors... Your happiest life will start when you're married. Will it? I've been happy on several occasions. <laughs> <laughs> but there, there are problems as a bachelor. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, when we were on the show, in the old Tonight Show, I remember I got an apartment. I moved out of the hotel. Yeah. You pushed me out of it. And I went and I, I started living in this apartment and there was a problem. Uh, it was a regular apartment, regular people living there. <laughs> and... Uh, I had neighbors for the first time, you know, before that in the hotel it was just transients. These are regular people came home every night and I lived there three months. Well, I don't cook. As a result, I didn't have any garbage. <laughs> and, you know, every day they put garbage out their door, you know, and they would look at me. I'm living here three months, no garbage outside the doorway. And they began to look at me funny, like, what's the matter, you're too good to show your garbage? <laughs> so what happened was that they now have a product for bachelors It's the supermarkets. It's called frozen garbage. <laughs> There's no defrosting, you just throw it out. You know, instant garbage. But they have different kinds. They have like cheap garbage, yeah. like uh, sardine cans, you know, and uh, coffee grounds. You can buy this, nothing. There's nothing to be ashamed of. But then they have very expensive garbage, like lobster shells and uh, champagne bottles empty. And that's what I buy. I buy that kind of garbage, the most expensive garbage. And I put that out after breakfast. <laughs> and you should see those neighbors look at me now like, oh boy, that's some neighbor, look at his garbage, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I have seen people look at things like that, particularly in a hotel room as you walk down the, uh, the lobby, or uh, the, the, what do you call it? The hallway. Oh, right, you yeah. can see what they ordered if the trays were outside. That's How right. about a movie review? Last time I saw it was at Lawrence of Arabia. Yes, Jack, and that's why I, I like that it. picture. I, that's, I think it's one of the best pictures ever made. It's a in my It is a tremendous epic movie. As a matter of fact, it was just submitted down in Mexico for the uh, film festival down there. Mm. Uh, and uh, it's a, oh, it, well, as you remember. What's your review now? Well, no, it's my, well, I, I just want to tell the movie that it is a great epic movie. It took three years to make cost $15 million, and I came with makeup that day. Because $15 million, I wanted to look nice, you know. <laughs> what a movie. Four hours of, of the kind of uh, photography we have never seen. Remember, the tremendous expanse of sand, desert, miles and miles of it, you know. No hotels, nothing to break it up, you know. <laughs> this is pure photography. And in the beginning, you don't know that the movie is on because you don't see anything, and suddenly you realize you're seeing the sun. It fills the whole screen, blazing hot. And everyone has got to drink water and anything. And it's really, you should bring a lunch. It's four hours, a long, great movie. In the movie is Peter O'Toole. Peter O'Toole's in the movie. Alec Guinness, Anthony Quinn, of course, he's in every movie. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Jack Hawkins, Mel uh, uh, Jose Farrar, everybody's in the movie. It starts out, takes place in Arabia during the First World War. And what it is, is it's a movie about the British wanting to get the Arabs on their side to fight the Turks. That was the whole idea. And so you see the British generals are sitting around and they're talking. And they say, we certainly wish we could get the Arabs on our side. You know, good idea, you know. Now in comes Peter O'Toole. Peter O'Toole is the star of the movie. He plays T. Lawrence. He's the blondest actor you've ever seen in your life. Blonde with blue eyes, but such blondness. And throughout the movie, you know, the sun is beating down. 
Well, he keeps getting blonded throughout the movie. And by the end of the movie, you can't see him anymore. He's almost all blonded out. And he has beautiful blue eyes, you know. Well, he comes in, and he's only a lieutenant. And he's standing there, remember? They're talking about the, which is one if we can get the others. And he starts to yell. I can bind the whole nation together. Just let me get there, and I would... And they say, and they get embarrassed. You know, these English people, they hate emotion, you know. They say, all right, get him out of the desert. Into the desert, into the desert. Out of the desert. <laughs> You know, and they shoot him out, and he goes out to see the head of the whole Arab nation, Alec Guinness. <laughs> it's all in the family. And he comes in, and Alec Guinness plays the part of Prince Fatil. And he's dressed with all these crazy rags, you know, what we call schmatters. And diamonds everywhere, and he's in a tent. And he says, he looks at uh, Peter O'Toole, he says, what is it, Englishman? And he starts to yell. I can bind the whole nation together. Just give me the chance. And that one says, out of the tent, out of the tent. Get him out of the tent. <laughs> he can't take him either. So they send him out of the tent. You know, he's yelling and screaming, you know. And now you see him traveling through the desert. The sun is bearing down on him, this blonde man on a blonde camel. And, what, uh, and the reason this is peculiar, because now he's going to see Anthony Quinn, who is the head of all the nomadic tribes. And you, and you should see the nose on Anthony Quinn. What a nose. Ah, ha, he, ha, ho, ho. Like that, you know. They call it La Neza, a new name. Ah, ha, he, ho. That's so the sand shouldn't get in. That's just kind of nose. And then, in case the kids don't know in the tribe who's the leader, he has another nose, comes from here, like that. And he has black piercing eyes. They all have that. You know, the Arabs have black eyes. And they see this blonde fellow riding out of the desert with blue eyes, you know, and they look at him with their black piercing eyes, but Peter O'Toole has blue piercing eyes, <laughs> and his blue piercing eyes pierces right through their black piercing eyes, <laughs> and they yell, all right, all right, you're our leader, but don't look at us anymore, <laughs> can't stand to look at you, so he becomes the leader of all the nomadic tribes, and he starts to lead them in battle against the tribes, every battle, he wins. It's a great movie. There's no women in this movie. No kissing, just shooting and killing. Oh, boy. <laughs> and what happens is that he wins everywhere he goes. He just slaughters them all. So finally, the Turks, they catch him one day. Yeah. And then... Don't tell anyone. Oh, well, no. Well, they, they beat him up. You're right. They beat him up with a stick, a dirty Turkish stick. <laughs> oh. And then they throw him into the shade. And that's the first time he's been in the shade in four hours. <laughs> so what happens? He wakes up, and he's entirely different. His eyes aren't piercing, nothing anymore. He's just a nice fellow. He says, hello, where am I? <laughs> they said, you've been leading us in battle, the Arabs say. He says, what battle? He says, I don't like to fight. It turns out he was suffering from sunstroke throughout the whole movie. <laughs> and he wakes up and he says, I'm a mechanic. He goes back to England. <laughs> That's on a nice note. That's the mystery of Deed. <laughs> Deed Lawrence. Plug to you. Enjoy it. <laughs> It's a remarkable movie, and T. Lawrence was a remarkable man. You know that, I don't want to go into this deeply because we're going to do something about it on the show in a couple of weeks, Lowell Thomas. You know that Lowell Thomas actually discovered Lawrence of Arabia? He made, he created Lawrence of Arabia? That's right. Well, two weeks ago in England, I was with his brother, the Professor Lawrence, and he told me that without Lowell Thomas, England would never have heard of, of Lawrence Nobody of Arabia. Nobody in England He was created, and they, they never heard of him until Lowell Thomas did his lecture. Anyhow, uh, thanks, Milt, and come back again. Oh, it's a pleasure. Us, uh, on a regular basis, I hope. I hope so. We'll talk about money oh, later. It's a pleasure to come back. <laughs> Say a lot. God love you. Good night. Good night. Good night, old time. It's been my impression in the past that women writers, however dainty their prose are, upon a personal meeting, are about as feminine as uh, Ernest Borgnine in a steam bath. Uh, this nice, smug generalization was shattered when I met Mary McCarthy who is upon contact a soft-spoken, twinkling, honest, and completely feminine person. Those of you who have read the nation's number one bestseller, The Group, know that uh, Mary McCarthy's prose isn't dainty, but one gets the impression that this is how Ernest Hemingway would have written had he gone to Vassar. <laughs> I should like you now to meet America's number one lady of letters, Miss Mary McCarthy. This is an unexpected guest. This is Miss Miller, Miss McCarthy. She's an old friend of mine, and she was just here, couldn't find a seat. Mary McCarthy, you have been admired for a great, great many years, 
as perhaps the finest writer, uh, American writer. And, uh, but you've never, never had a never. great commercial, yes, you have. You have never had the great commercial success, although you've had many successes, literary successes, as today. How does Mary McCarthy take this huge, enormous commercial success, motion pictures and everything, how do you take it? Well, my husband called up from Paris the other day where we live, and he asked me about the various things that were happening to me that were making me feel so strange, stranger and stranger. Uh, and I told him about the Vassar Club, talking to the Vassar Club in Washington and other events. And I uh, finally said, and now Dr. Bonwood is making me some television teeth. And he said, come home. Oh. <laughs> your husband, that's the way I feel. Your husband with the information service in Paris? Uh, he's, with the, he's the chief of information for OECD. Oh, I see. And your home is now Paris? Yes. Now, I'm not being indelicate, although, you know, I'm not adverse to being indelicate. I know. But, you know the words got into Paris, huh? No, but I mean, you have said, I remember a lot of things that you've said on the BBC or that you've been quoted in magazines. You know, you're in, you're in a new Queen magazine in England. Did you know that there's a... Yes. Yes. And you're an encounter. I read, just read an article in Encounter. Uh, that you have always found sex comical. That sex itself is amusing, and you've always written it as comedy. How, how, how do you explain that? Because I've had a few laughs in my day, and I wanted to know. <laughs> sex is comical to the people taking part in it. It's comical to others. Uh, imagine being on the other side of the hotel partition, and sex is either disgusting or comical to the people who are not participating. Um, and I can't imagine, people say, why do you write about such uh, depressing and ridiculous sexual scenes in your book? You must have a very low view of sex. Uh, uh, it isn't that. I, would, I, I can't imagine writing about, uh, you know, happy sex. You can only write about it when it's funny or when it's grotesque. Uh, that's my position. Uh, I think it would be indecent to write about happy sex. I see. That is, I'm not talking about love. I'm talking about sex. Yeah, I understand. You go along with that, Miss Miller? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I tell you, old dear, when you write your book, wow, wee wee. But You're inexperienced. inexperienced. Well, never mind. <laughs> well, um, your book is a sensational. I, uh, that's not the right word to talk to you, but my vocabulary with you is limited. But I, but I mean by that, it is it is uh, it is sensational. My aunt read it, and her eyebrows haven't come down yet. It's a <laughs> it's a shock. Have you read the what's, group? What's the name of the book? The group. <laughs> Another buyer. <laughs> oh boy, it's a live Kinsey report. There oh, we no. are. No. It's beautifully written. There's and one wonderful. chapter. Two, darling. <laughs> Two and six. <laughs> no, six is no, 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 no. There's one chapter. Well, six is no May Dance, sweetie. It's uh, a. <laughs> <laughs> I find it. I, I find it. I, I just. I, it's it's great, you know. Miriam, Miriam, write it. Wow, Miriam, yeah. <laughs> no, I don't want to. Uh, listen, I'm clowning around. I'm making it look like a, you know it's a big silly book. It's not. It's a very serious work. But I do think it's comical. It's do you mind? Meant, it's meant to be funny, and it's also meant to be I'm serious. glad I didn't make a fool of myself. I found it pretty funny. That was the idea. You're a good reader. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> do you think that women are equipped for, uh, for uh, that there, the potential of women is not, aren't, is not, aren't being used today? I mean, other than sex. I mean, uh, should we put them? Yes, you know the question and the answer, so why don't you work it out? <laughs> All right. Uh, I suppose you mean that uh, women are a sort of natural resource that are be that's being not being tapped properly. Well, is that the point of the book, uh, kind of? No. It isn't. Well, all right. Uh, I thought it was that women weren't weren't given an opportunity in our society. No, uh, that wasn't the point of the book. Oh well, all right. Uh, these women, these girls, they're not really women even. They're girls still. I think they the oldest is about 29 when the book ends. Uh, they, they are living, like many women and many men, women do it a little more, rather vicariously through objects, and they're being sort of in consumer training. Uh, and uh, that, at least, is part of the point. But uh, it's not uh, a sad book about what a waste of femininity. Oh, I no. hadn't thought about it from this point of view. Well, how do you feel on that subject? Are, about are... the waste of femininity? Well, yes. Do you think there is a waste of femininity? I don't know. The, the, to answer seriously, I mean uh, uh, the only place where I've noticed much difference, uh, something that uh, was different and in some way perhaps slightly better about women, was actually behind the Iron Curtain. 
Uh, that is in Poland and Yugoslavia, which is not, not exactly behind the curtain, but well, mm. we all know it. Uh, it's more or less behind the curtain. In any case, there are many more professional women, really professional, doctors, scientists, and uh, they're not regarded as exceptional. Uh, they're married, have babies, uh, uh, and so on, and yet they're much more professional. Uh, uh, they're more uh, sure of themselves without being aggressive. Uh, they're rather deferential to men in conversation. Uh, they don't talk all the time like American women. Uh, the men talk, but they go to their laboratories and uh, offices and so on. And this uh, impressed me quite favorably as compared to the American career woman. You, um, I think it's, is it 65 or 75 percent of the doctors in the Soviet Union are women? I didn't know that. Well, it's, it's, it's at least 70 percent of them are women. You once said on the BBC, I heard you say that, that men are more sensitive than women, that women are more intelligent and quicker. In that, that kind of intelligence, quick intelligence, well, you know how little girls are usually brighter than little boys in class. Yes. Uh, and little girls are sort of miniature adults, uh, while boys are boys. Uh, the little girls you feel are sort of sold out to the adult world. They're traitors to the world of childhood. Mm. And boys are, have feelings. And I think they, they grow up something like that. Uh, the men, in my experience, are more sensitive than women. They in other are. words, I believe the reverse of what is usually thought about this. From looking uh, at America from Paris, and from France, and from Europe, where you've been how many years have you been away? Well, a year and a half this oh, time. Oh, I thought it was longer. Well, what do you have to say about, just generally about our country? You're an American, but how do you, what, what critical thing can you say? Um, Hopefully critical. Well, I, I don't feel critical. The thing about being in Europe is that you don't feel critical of America in, in Europe. You have to come home. Oh, uh, well, now that you're home, what do you find that distresses uh, you a bit? Well, it seems to me that everybody is talking about money all the time. Uh, it's quite striking uh, that, uh, you know, conversations you overhear, it's always about money and taxes, uh, mm -hmm. no matter what kind of people. Well, Mary McCarthy, I'm delighted to meet you, and I know that the audience, the vast audience that has read the group and your other, uh, and your other books was delighted to see you and to know you, and I'm glad you didn't wear the television teeth since you brought it up. I didn't notice it until just now. <laughs> Good night, Mary McCarthy. Uh, the dentist to be sorry. Thank you. I'm delighted to have known you. Good night, Mr. Mary McCarthy, the author of the group.